I'm here with Professor Marcella Petruba. Um, so thanks for letting us interview you today. Thank you. Um, so what interests you in research at the beginning of your career? Yes, I'd always felt that I understood a little about the pathology of diseases, that we didn't know what caused many of the diseases we were seeing, other than perhaps the most common. And um, I always felt I had more of a curiosity and wanted to get back into an environment where I could spend more time reading and learning. I also actually really enjoyed the prospect of lab work. Not that I'd done a lot of that at that stage, um, but it was incredibly exciting to see all the ex uh, equipment and the, the, the work that people were doing at the time with genes and sequencing. And I found that it wasn't disappointing. That was the best bit, actually. I really enjoyed becoming involved in a working lab. So how did you actually get involved in research at that stage? Well, it's very unique to individuals, but at that stage I went to a couple of interviews at Moorfields where they were looking for people for a PhD programme. Fell up and I wrote a grant for a project for two years funding to the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, who at the time still funded laboratory type and clinical research. And that was successful. Um, uh, I took a week off to do that and had never written a grant before. I was given help by showing other people's grants and I could look at the way that people wrote those applications and my mentor obviously was very helpful. But I think that um, there's no shortcut to just getting your sleeves rolled up and having a go. That's correct and the uh, trainees can take uh, time out of training for research uh, and there's academic paths as well. Of course that's something that at the time I was doing this there was no structural formal path for taking time out but it had been widely accepted that most people took um, opportunity to do research between the registrar and senior registrar stage at that time. So how did you become a professor? Again, this is very different, different for everyone, different people have different routes. Through the work that I did for my PhD, I then decided that I'd like to finish my clinical training, obviously. Um, I did a research fellowship after completing my um, uh, SPR training and, um, and then I did a clinical fellowship. And at that time, I also then decided I'd like to write grants to get further funding to carry on with my research. And ideally, I wanted to be able to get funding that would allow me to be a clinician and a scientist, um, maintain your, your clinical training standards and your, and your whole portfolio. You have to make sure you do enough clinics in the week and, and surgery if that's still what you're doing at that stage if you're interested in a surgical specialty. I did because I was seeing patients with inherited eye disease, I'd prefer to focus all my energies into research. So dropping surgery is a major, major decision. Many people are not comfortable doing that because they enjoy it, they've trained a long time, and there are many other reasons to do it. Um, the career pathway to becoming a professor then is a university track, if you like, where you become a lecturer initially and then a senior lecturer. And there are promotion criteria depending upon where you're working, which university, say it's Cardiff University in, in the instance here, which allow you to apply for promotion. But obviously publications and research grants are the most important. Um, absolutely essential. Without that you will not get uh, a chair. My working week is one day a week clinical and four days a week in the university. In the, in the uh, clinical period I do a clinic um, and or then additional clinical activities. So in my working week, I then spend the four days in the university um, writing uh, grants and papers, supervising PhD students, of which it's usually in the case you have between one and about four at any one time, uh, teaching undergraduate students, whether that be through lectures, practical seminars, of writing assessments or marking exams. So what are the benefits of being an ophthalmologist uh, interested in research? Well, I think it's a really exciting time in ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. I mean, ophthalmology has been at the forefront of a lot of discoveries in genetics, right back to the discovery of the retinoblastoma gene as one of the sort of paradigms of, a, of an oncogene. So we've been at the forefront you know, of new gene discoveries in retinitis pigmentosa back in the 80s, and it's carried through to the first gene therapy trials and new drug development. Whilst, as an individual, you might not be involved in that whole slew of new dif discoveries, I think it's still exciting because your training allows you to refer patients, um, collaborate with colleagues, go to meetings where you can discuss the latest developments and it motivates your clinical practice and it sharpens what you want to do in your clinics. 
and it begins to open doors to the possibilities of new treatments being developed. So it's a really exciting time. Uh, do you have any final tips for the trainees? I think my biggest tip was take a risk. If you feel that you want something enough and you've done a huge amount of work in the background, reading, writing, papers, research, grants, <clears throat> and you feel it's really your passion, be prepared occasionally to take a risk, whether that is basically not applying for a job that everyone tells you you must apply for, or um, deciding to do something that other people just haven't even thought of, completely different, out of the box, or going abroad. That's great. Well, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Well, I hope that's interesting to everyone, as it was for me.